second now. Got it. Got it. We are live. Unless you're watching a recording long after the fact. Welcome aboard. It's time, stargazers, once again, for more cutting edge cosmology with the staff and the brain trust of the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit, Santa Barbara, California's longtime telescope and astrophysics club. I'm your no nut and host, Ron Heron, who asked most of the questions in this 115th episode of the SBAU Astro Hour. It's for May 1st. Welcome to May 2023 to the 7th next Sunday. Stand by to meet some of the brightest and most intelligent lovers of outer space that I've ever known. We're on Zoom. It's Monday morning. And we're going to talk about the night sky again up into the evening black to check on planets. The full moon will be the flower moon this Friday when we all meet at uh, Museums Farron Hall and have an LCO night. We'll talk about that later on. Our variable star of the month or week, whatever, is H. Hydre, excuse me, V. Hydre and his orchestra. New uh, Hydre. Uh, yeah, gentlemen, we'll introduce you in a minute. A dolphin and a swan. A lot of animals up there in the sky, the constellations of the week, a pair of binary stars, one blue and gold. Uh, Saturn, we're going to go out to the big moon Titan. Literally, we're going to land there someday. And Auriga, bright open star clusters. I've got to find out about Auriga. Plus a recap of our Astronomy Day outreach on Saturday. Let's meet the gang. In glorious white, hair and beard, once again, winner of the monthly Santa Claus lookalike contest is our president, Beloved Jerry Wilson. Jerry, you and Pat are hunkered Good in with your Good Tesla. Morning. Good morning. Running the show. He's our temporary, well, permanent webmaster. And uh, six, seven years, you and I, well, I came in about a year into your first uh, term because Adrian, who I was thinking about booking, Adrian Lopez, a 17-year-old Dos Pueblos boy, was our VP. And I, I was going to book him, but I found out he went over to Matt. He, he bailed on astronomy down no, at he, he went to not, he, he went to particle physics, not math. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, we've had those. We can handle it. That's heavy on the quantum. And the man speaking he's there. Not too. seventeen. Not seventeen anymore. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I've seen some people. About twenty-seven now. Still, <laughs> still tall and gangly. In front of the map of Ukraine is our incredible outreach coordinator, the man behind most of the success Saturday, going to give us a report, Chuck McPartland. Morning. He's married to a Pat also. Pat McPartland, his wife, his bride is a co-secretary and our single merchandise manager. And I put my order in for the calendar, which will arrive, I guess, later in the fall. And there's Bruce Murdoch, who is married to uh, Bonnie, a longtime right. active member. Theater Organ Society up and running again post pandemic. Bruce, you're the president. Oh, yeah, we typically have our an open console uh, once a month on the second Saturday, but this month it was on the first Saturday. Gotcha. So we haven't had, don't have one scheduled for June yet. Okay, well I should. Actually, don't have one scheduled for May either, for that matter. But uh... do, you, do you have a cat that can share your screen as well as the Chuck? Because <laughs> I'm about to introduce the cat if I get the name. Well, our cat's Shadow. name is Boots. He, he adopted us. And we're several other neighbors. We're all cat uh -huh. lovers on the screen. I don't happen to have one. I'm allergic to them, but so is Chuck. I, I can them. get you one real easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the long hairs that I had to return. I had an Angora, and boy, it just gave me COVID. You wouldn't believe, Jerry. But you also have a dog. Yes. And, and you also have a great sense of humor. We like to start these um, weekly programs every Monday morning with uh, some of the levity. Involved in the silly science cartoons that President Jerry forwards to us, and I've got them all listed. I got 11. You said you sent out 14, but let's look at them one at a time as you call them up and start this program. Here we go. <laughs> Great moment in science. This, is now, what... this, one, this one eludes me. I don't completely get the impact of this. I mean, I understand gravity and Newton and stuff, but well, why all the chop chops on trees? Yeah, think, Stan, think Stanley Kubrick, the the, yeah. uh, the large slab that affected mankind. That's yeah. This was well, why simple. were all the trees cut down? Also, yeah, that's the yeah. question. Yeah, so we'll have to think about that one. Well, he couldn't have gotten the apple off well, the tree. tree for the apple to fall out of, so the the uh, blank. Yeah, there's no. Yep. All right, you guys should all have this one. 
Maybe in so your this is, Oh, yeah, I like that one. <laughs> Day six of astrophotography, my God, volume one. Tim uh, Crawford is watching right now and laughing. Beavis and Butthead. Boss, we're getting limited electronic transmissions from many galaxies away. We've concluded these two are the supreme leaders. Well, you got that right. Is Beavis no. the guy on the, well, it's too late. Men's toilet. Who's the one on the right? Oh, okay. Who's the one with a big mouth? You know what? I didn't yeah. see the bottom of that. It, what? Yeah, Ocom chooses a razor. Who is Ocom? Is he a? This character? is a very clever one. There is a there is a, a saying in philosophy called Ocom's razor, and it it says if you have several potential answers to a question, the simplest one is the right one. You okay. know, mostly. <laughs> so they, so he's looking at razors and he thinks, oh, those are way too complicated. So. <laughs> Well, uh, he's not a priest, is he, or a brother? Uh, he he was a monk yeah. of some kind. Yeah, oh, yeah. He was yeah. back in the Middle Ages. I've always wondered why did why more blades? Why not just one? But remember Gillette back at the beginning. Yeah, of those the those extra blades really do benefit me. All right, just like the <laughs> ancient microscope. Hey, it's a mammoth, I think. Yeah, alley oop, early microscope. Yep. They weren't that good. Flat Earth Society has an eclipse of the Earth against the moon, and there it is. <laughs> You've had this one before. It's several. Did we? Yeah, but that's all right. Uh, pardon our mess in space is they're trying to get to what? The moon? How about that? No, it's just this. Oh, this guy, he's just out there cruising through space. And sure enough, your tax dollars at work. This area yeah, coming soon, stars, galaxies, planets. And they goes, how about that? The universe really is expanding. <laughs> well, you know, this is more stars or galaxies or planets in back of the sign. Yeah. They're all in front of it. Okay. The side of it. Most of them. Okay. Right. Well, I, all right. Here we have a scientist. I guess this is part of the <laughs> team checking out Mars. I don't know, says one minute looking at the screen. One minute, the power. The rover was transmitting perfectly clear images of the Martian surface. Next minute, I got Bupkus. And there's that cartoon from the old Warner Brothers. Yeah, Marvin the Martian. The Martian, yeah. Not bad. <laughs> and this is Peppermint Patty? Yeah. No, no, no. That's um, Lucy. Sally. Sally. Yeah, this is Lucy. Are oh, you that's sure? right. That's Sally. Lucy Van Pelt is the dark-haired one that takes the ball away at the last minute. Yeah, I know. Okay. This is Sally. Sally is the sister of uh, Char Charlie, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I never would have thought Charles Schultz would have used this word in any of his cartoons, but he said it only in math. And you'd mm -hmm. buy 60 cantaloupes and no one asked what the is wrong with you. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not. Uh, he took Schultz's drawing and he added his own tap. Yeah. Oh, here. OK, that's that's not plagiarism. All right, we have the Earth. Earth Day. I like this one. I actually wrote some stuff. Is it Christmas? Is Earth Day like Christmas? That was Saturday. I'm going to get a report here in a minute. Uh, and we buy presents for the planet. Uh, birthday. Do we have candles? Uh, July 4th is when we congratulate ourselves on the world we built, which is slowly unraveling if you read all of that. But there is a question there that can be answered or asked. And I don't know if you guys answered it or not. You had a good time on Saturday. We'll talk about that in a minute. This is a good one. Where do you get these? These come from This your one is Fraz. This is a good one. He's, that's a good strip. Yeah. All right. Is that OK? Here we have uh, Carnage. This is sound like in the South after a night of tornadoes. but. Don't be so negative, guys, as one of the survivors. Well, they got fire there, fire around them, little spurts of flame. Yeah, it looks like they blew up their physics lab. Right. Ah. He says, the particles from the laboratory are all still here. The experiment just arranged them into a new configuration. <laughs> and they have a new acronym for um, SpaceX rocket explosions. It's oh. rapid, unscheduled... Um, disassembly. Disassembly, yeah. <laughs> it was a raging success, Elon said. Yeah. Yeah, and we all watched it. Okay, <laughs> physics exists. Cats. I'm sure. yep. <laughs> uh, how do you suppose they took that picture? They, they... Oh, they just have a little gravity anomaly in the house. 
Yeah. Well, they, they the church church is that. I like this one. All right. Dad's lying on the beach and the kids uh, using the glasses to focus the sun on his crotch area. And he's taking his sweet time, kid. We're going to get ice cream when daddy gets up. Okay. Well, daddy's about, dad's to, about to get up. He really is. <laughs> I call this experimental optics. <laughs> we have a plethora of goodies. Nighttime, night sky on a normal day. Oh, this, but... is, this one was, this is our weekend here. Yeah, this was yeah. astronomy day. Was it like it is right now outside? Sunday? For Actually, most of the day, yeah. Right, right now. Did it ever come out? Sure, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So you For sure, periods of time. No, it was it was nice from uh, some point in the afternoon onward. And then uh, from 7 o'clock until about 9.30, it was pretty clear. So ah. how, many, how many people showed up at Camino Real? Uh, 526, something like that. Would it be safe to think that nighttime was far more successful and packed with people with the night? No, no. It was 363 during the day and then 163 uh, in the evening. Who among you spent 12 hours? Wasn't it 10 to 10? 10 a.m.? 10 to 10. We set up at 9 oh. and broke down at 10 p.m. Um, so Chrissy was there the whole time, Tom Totten, uh, Pat and me, Martin and Janet. That There's you know, Martin back there. There's yeah. Chuck. I forget who this is. Probably a customer. That's a customer. Tom Totten's on the left and white. Right. There's Jim, Tim uh, Crawford. Tim explaining telescope making to a mother and son. There you go, Tim. His real name is Tom. Yeah. There is our there's, beloved treasurer, Colin. Yeah, it's Colin, a, it's and the Max Edgar. and Colin show. And this is Tessa. And... Yeah. Uh, Tom and Whittemore. Whittemore. This has got the, the braids on her hair? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. She's a, oh, doing all right. And here's Chuck with Tim mm -hmm. and a couple, a mom and son. And Chuck's telescope with the rock from space. Yeah. Hitting back with the rock. All right. There's our beloved Bruce. <laughs> Joe Doyle, Edgar, and a little hydrogen alpha scope. Ah. Or solar. I don't know if it's hydrogen alpha. alpha. Yeah, it's H alpha. It's a okay. lunch. Is that Edgar's okay. scope or is that Joe's scope? I think that's, that's Joe's scope. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, okay. So Edgar's on the left, or is that just yeah. a scope? That's no, Edgar. that's Edgar. Edgar did not bring a scope. But that is Edgar oh. in the black. Yes. Yeah, that is Edgar. Back from the Philippines. God, how did those guys get so old? I certainly am not getting that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Chrissy. Yeah, I brought my book of pictures because you couldn't see anything. <clears throat> well, I hope Chrissy doesn't leave us. I guess she's tenuring or giving up her job at the museum. But well, she's, yeah. she's she's got a she's got a job teaching in elementary school, and she's part time at the museum, and they wanted her full time, and she just can't do that. And so mm -hmm. they Less they did hire a new guy. He's from Michigan, and he's starting on June six, supposedly. Well, let's get him into the meetings. Got one and here, today. and here is um, Tim again explaining and demonstrating how you make a mirror from two plates of glass and seven or eight samples and something. And uh, there's it's got all oh, the, the, these are the uh, grit from coarse grit down through fine, and then down um, somewhere they have a um, oh he's holding it the polishing agent cerium oxide. Yeah, our kids are poking their fingers into the pitch, which yeah. is a tree sap that has the turpentine boiled out of it. Giving those kids a stimulus to go after astronomy, kids. Those are not the yeah. samples from Mars. There is our missing link yeah. next to yes. uh, next to Chuck's missing link, or actually very alive and an active link. The uh, Pat McPartland, our robust. Yeah. Tom is on jury duty this morning. Tom Whittemore. Well, he'll get off. That hair is just too white. <laughs> well, they don't like people that think. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> no, no, that they, they, they I'll, I'll ex the um, you can get that impression, but I've been on a couple of juries and I've been excused immediately as soon as they find out I have a doctorate in physics. And other times I've been kept on as soon as they discover I have a doctorate in physics. Well, it's it depends. I've seen it on one jury. If it's, a, 
It's they want the jury to be one mind. They don't care what the mind is, whether it's critical or sympathetic. They want the jury to be one mind. So they try and get it as homogeneous as possible. So, Mr. President, you're saying you got on the jury but got kicked off. You were not the chair, the no, foreman. He's not saying that. No, he's not saying that. So, you, so. were you the foreman of many, either of those juries you did last? I was week? actually foreman on both of those that I was on. Well, of course you are. So I have been seated on one jury, and it was a shoplifting case. And they normally don't like engineers. There were four engineers in that jury. They wanted people to sift the yeah. stuff apart. Yeah, the only jury I was all, ever on was a shoplifting. Two and a half days deliberating a guy that put a carton of cigarettes in his jacket. I mean, I'm glad I've been rejected. Oh, no, I was on sense. some interesting jury cases, but we won't go over that here. <laughs> no, we won't. We're going to go into the sky for the moon. It's this Friday night when we have our big meeting with LCO. Yes. Now, this is just a shot of the very nearly full moon. You can see that the edge around here does not continue a true circle. It's got some shadow features on the side. So, and the yellowish is just the balance that, that the processor chose. There's not necessarily a eclipse going on because it couldn't because it's not a completely full moon. Okay, but it's called a- We are having an eclipse this weekend. We won't get to see it though. It's going to be on the other side of the earth. Isn't it? That's right. And it's a subtle eclipse. It's not. It's not a penumbral eclipse. It's not a, an umbral. Not an oh, umbral. Yeah, I get those two mixed up. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a dark eclipse where it goes through the core of the Earth's shadow. It's a penumbral eclipse where they just touch through the outer, lighter regions of it. So you can tell here that this one at mid eclipse, this is a little darker, and this is what the moon would look like if it was not in eclipse. <clears throat> this is the type of eclipse over here that's going to happen this Friday. But I think it's down in um, the South Pacific that you get to see it. Or is it Asia and the Middle East? It's not us. <laughs> not us. It's across Africa, Europe, Asia. I think full moon happens this Friday at about one o'clock in the afternoon. So the moon will not be up for us. Is there such a thing as a full eclipse of the moon where you it just disappears and it's black? Or don't you see something, some orange? You usually yeah, see a little bit of something. Moon. That's the total eclipse. And, you know, first the moon starts shading on one side, gets dark. Then the shadow moves across and the moon turns a bright orange and it gets fairly dark. Uh, it's called a blood moon. And it used to be a portent of wars, except that mathematicians could figure out right reliably when it was going to happen and the wars didn't happen at that time it just meant at some time in the future there was going to be a war but that's a prediction that's easy to make you don't have to it's like predicting your death but you won't say when so after midnight right yeah. <laughs> oh that's right after midnight for Betelgeuse I sent you a collage of uh, one of the uh, eclipses that were taken at Westmont yeah you did very nice pictures I saw them I didn't include them in here I got them after I put this package together so, ah, uh, well, maybe in the future we can run by yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I'll put it in yeah. the bank. But when we what? have, a, well, mm -hmm. if there's ever a solar eclipse, the sun does completely disappear. Do we come, sometimes see the corona behind the moon? Yeah, you see the corona during a total solar eclipse. But it, I mean, how about the ring? I mean, depending that's on how a, far that's away. an annular eclipse. That's the kind. There was a hybrid eclipse just the last week or two weeks ago on Friday, I guess, uh, in Australia. And that was a hybrid eclipse where part of the time it was a ring of fire. It was an annular eclipse, but part of the time it was a total eclipse because the moon was changing its distance, you know, over the course of the eclipse. Right. But there are there are incidents in history, are there not, where Amer uh, the explorers from the old world talk some of the new people into giving up something because they're about to obliterate your moon. That was Columbus, yeah, in, Columbus in, the, in actually, the Caribbean. He knew that was coming. Yeah. And that would have been a lunar eclipse. No, that was a solar eclipse. Oh, it was a solar, okay. It was a total solar eclipse. And he said, you know, the, oh, I, you know, I think it was a total solar eclipse. It was a total of one kind or the other, but he told the Indians that, um, you know, 
his God was angry with them unless they gave them some food or something like that. And, and so he was going to make the, I think it was the sun go away. Ooh. And now they must, have, they must have experienced eclipses in the past. Yeah. But I guess they had no idea that it was a natural occurrence. But how would they know when? They wouldn't well, probably know when. The Mayans would know when. Yeah, yeah. Ryans were good at that. Well, if <clears throat> what you need so is, is a society that persists over a long period of time that has written records. Yes. <laughs> we're going into That's the sky. Chinese. Hello, gentlemen. We're, let's check the uh, night sky for the evening planets, Venus and Mars, mostly. Yeah, this is looking west. Um, there's Mars up here in Gemini, see the two twins. Yeah. This is Venus, which you can't miss in the evening if the clouds are gone. Right between the horns of the bull. Yeah, and it's moving up this way as the um, constellations sink. These are the winter constellations, the late fall and winter constellations. And this is like, um, what, nine o'clock. So about an hour after the sky gets dark, and you can see that Orion is slipping out of sight. Down in here is uh, where the word trapezium is. That's, a, that's where the uh, great nebula in Orion is. And um, I thought there was one more planet in here. I guess not. Hmm. Okay. So those are the planets of evening. They will be gone in a few months. And then we'll see them come around into the morning sky. Okay. Where do you suppose the old gas giants went? Uranus? We'll Jupiter. get to that. Yeah, okay, here we go. Pegasus. Mm -hmm. Sagitta. Delphini. Oh, Delphinius. The, the dolphins. dolphins. Yeah. Yeah. And another horrible astronomy star map. <laughs> <laughs> Also known as Porphidius, uh, Porpoise. No, it isn't. Never mind. <laughs> okay. And Sagittarius is a depression, then, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so this it's is a small, small arrow. Yeah. yeah. It's a small, inconspicuous constellation. Nothing so mysterious as Equilus, 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 the, the horse. Equilus, yeah. And uh, the, the reason this map is up here is that there are two globular clusters in here. Uh, that's the symbol for globular cluster and two open clusters. Oh, those are planetary nebulae. Planet, okay, planetary nebulae. Depends on which planetary and program you're looking at what the yeah. symbol is. So, but the focus this time is on this. This is the finder chart for NGC 6934, which is a very dramatic, um, globular cluster. And this is a Hubble picture of it. Uh. It's very dense. Um, it's also called Caldwell 47. Now there's um, there's an English astronomer. God, what's his name? His middle name is Caldwell, but his... Um, Patrick Moore. Moore, yeah. Yeah, so... He didn't. He has his own catalog, but he did. He couldn't use his last name because then he'd be conflicting with Messier's. It would be M forty seven. So very confusing. So he called him the Caldwell catalog. This is about fifty two thousand light years away from our sun. It was discovered by William Herschel in eighteen seventy five. The cluster uh, is in. A, wait, wait, wait. Eight uh, must be seventeen seventy. Sorry, I. Sometimes do that with numbers. Seventeen eighty-five, right? Yes. Got dyslexia with a date. Or, yeah. Okay. It, now, is this a blur to the naked eye, uh, like a, a fuzzy star, or can we not see it? It's telescopic. This, yeah. Telepathic. Okay. <laughs> is there a black hole in the middle of that? It's ninth magnitude. If you look at it with your naked eye, you won't see it because you can only see the six magnitudes. So each magnitude is two and a half times in brightness. So this is two and a half times two and a half. What is that? Six times? Like two five. Times two and a half again. <clears throat> yeah. Huh. Magnitudes too dim. Yeah. So it's way too dim for that. And uh, But you need a small telescope or binoculars to see it. 
a six inch telescope, which is a small starter size that will see to 12th magnitude. So that would easily pick this up and show it very dramatically. But the interesting thing about this is that these, these globular clusters um, are like, they're sort of in our galaxy, but they're not really in it. They have their own sphere around it, just like the Oort cloud is roughly a spherical cloud around our solar system. These globular clusters are in a spherical pattern. I wouldn't call it a cloud, it's not that dense, but they're in a spherical pattern around our galaxy. And so this one is orbiting in an, uh, an, an elliptical orbit with an eccentricity of 0.81 around the Milky Way. And its orbital plane is inclined 73 degrees to the plane of our Milky Way. So it gets way up there and way down on the other side. And it passes, because of its closeness to us, 52,000 light years, it has to pass through the disk. Um, so it probably mingles a lot with stars, depending on where it goes through, whether it goes through an arm or between arms. You suppose it was a captured mini galaxy from the local group? There's a lot of speculation about that. Um, that might be the core of a dwarf galaxy that was captured by it by our galaxy this would be a really uh, dwarf dwarf yeah but it could be many many times around and it's been shredded many times some of the um some of the the globular clusters show a visible this one doesn't but they show a visible trail on one side of the globular following the globular and the other one preceding the globular in its orbit. So it's being tidally disrupted by our galaxy. Um, there's, there are technical ways of describing globular clusters. This is what's called an Osterhof type one cluster. And that, that means the Osterhof catalog has, or this guy Osterhof noticed for, through spectroscopy that the stars of a globular cluster all have a very similar metallicity. And another galaxy will have a different type of metallicity, but similar for that cluster. And so this has what's called an intermediate metallicity, and that's an Osterhof type one cluster. Uh, it has a shapely Sawyer concentration class of eight, which means it has a tight core, 15 seconds across and, and uh, a half light radius for the whole thing of 36 seconds across. It's estimated that the whole mass of this thing has uh, 295,000 times the mass of the sun. So if they were all solar sized stars, that would be about 300,000 stars in it. But they, they range from uh, dwarfs to giants in it. You can see the orange stars a brighter yellowish stars there, 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 around there. Those are probably on the edge of the cluster and those are red giants. There's a really interesting dark feature right there, which appears to be real, but um, it's not an obscuring cloud in front of the galaxy or the uh, star cluster. Did you say that it's sort of on the edge or almost orbiting our Milky Way? It's, it's orbiting or its Milky Way, and its position is far enough out that it's kind of toward the edge. It's not yeah. in one of the arms or the spurs. It's no. on its own. So it probably was part of the local group. of. But it will, it will pass through one of the arms or one of the spurs on the way through. <clears throat> But it's our galaxy some, is a hundred thousand light years across, roughly. I thought it was now two hundred thousand. They changed yeah. it. Yeah, <clears throat> but it's so thin out there that the real drama happens in a one hundred thousand. So they're about fifty thousand. The edge of our galaxy is between fifty and a hundred thousand uh, light years out, and this thing has an orbital diameter of uh, fifty or an orbital radius of fifty nine thousand. 52,000. So it has to pass through part of our through part of our galaxy to get to the other part of its orbit. Wow. Well, if it were a mini galaxy, such as the Magellan Magellanic clouds that are out there orbiting yeah. Milky Way, 
why are they none of them like mini pinwheels? Why are they clusters of balls, kind of like an elliptical? Why why don't they turn like? Well, Ron, the, the Large Magellanic Cloud is almost a little barred spiral. I mean, it I does have some that. structure to it. <clears throat> well, I've never, I think I've seen pictures and I would have noticed if it looked like, you know, one of the regular spiral yeah. galaxies. Yeah, but, you know, they're, they're, they're too small to show those kind of phenomena. That, that needs quite an extent, I think. You, you don't see that structure in very, very small galaxies. Well, not, Plus, not they're, they're constantly being sort of roiled around by our gravity, so that that messes with their structure. Yeah, well, it, to me, a, a spiral seems to be pretty structured. Everything just goes yes. around the merry-go-round, but an elliptical or whatever this is on a small scale, how in the world do those stars keep from colliding with each other? <laughs> there is so much space between them. I guess that's space. what it is. Space is mostly space. But you yeah. do get in these really condensed globular clusters, you do get occasional collisions between these stars and they form what are called blue stragglers, which are stars that are more massive and hotter than you would expect from the age of the cluster. So that's what happens with some of them. And as often as not, they start orbiting each other and become binaries. Mm, there's more tough binary to do. That's tough to do. Really? I thought I, my understanding was that more than half the stars in the night sky are binary. Yes, but they formed that way. They didn't just encounter each other. They they formed from yeah. the same cloud. And and well, two stars that come close to each other in the sky cannot capture each other into a binary situation. There has to be a third star to carry energy away from the interaction, and then then the two can slip into a mutual orbit. Wow, that's a, okay. that's a junior level mechanics problem in physics. So um, this globular cluster, oh, I said something wrong a while earlier. Searches for variable stars have discovered 85 in this uh, cluster field that's shown here. And 79 of them are the RR Lyrae class. And it does say there is faint evidence of a tidal tail. Remember when I told you that some yeah. globulars have things streaming out and before? This one apparently is one of those, but it's not obvious in this uh, folk. Photographs of other globulars I've seen do show distinct um, tidal tails. So, and, and Ron, you like Cepheid variables. Uh, when they first, uh, you know, when Henrietta Leavitt identified Cepheid variables and they started using them as standard candles, there were these other variable stars that they didn't know about, these RR Lyrae stars. And um, they kind of messed up some of the distance measurements. And so they were getting these sort of conflicting distances to these globular clusters relative to what they were seeing with with Cepheid variables and it took a while for them to realize that there's a whole nother class of regular variables these are our Lyrae variables that also can be used as sort of standard candles but they're a different candle than the Cepheid variables variableness in stars is rare or common mm, it's it's it every star well most stars will probably go through it at some stage in their lifetime. But it's a brief sun, stage. There's if, our a, sun, there's, if our sun were variable, we'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? Yeah, I mean, it, it would yeah. complicate things, that's for sure. Okay. Our, our sun is burning hydrogen right now, and it'll burn hydrogen for another several billion years. And then when the hydrogen burning stops, then the sun will collapse a little bit. And the temperature inside will go up and it will become hot enough to now burn helium, which the star is now made out of then. It'll be made of helium and that'll burn it into carbon and other elements and stuff. The, but the when core. it goes down, the core, yeah, the core. Yeah. When it goes, when it shrinks down to increase the temperature, as soon as helium burning starts, comes on, that'll be a counterbalancing force to the collapse that's going on. And so for a period, there will be an oscillation as it, as it damps down. And so that will be a slight period of variation, but then that'll pass. Stars pass through the, as they go to different stages, they frequently do the small oscillation. Well, at some time yeah. in the way future, it's supposed to balloon up to beyond our orbit as a red giant too, right? Eventually. Well, eventually. not necessarily beyond our orbit, but yeah. Yeah. 
because hmm. the the idea if if the star if our star stays at same mass it will expand and and envelop our orbit and the earth but it's losing mass the solar wind is going off all the time and in the billion years that it's going to continue going the sun is predicted to lose enough mass that it will not um go out to our orbit yeah we'll yeah. move out basically yeah our orbit will move out and stay away from the sun's expansion so it's not going to become a betel juice yeah <laughs> more like an aldebaran if i disappear you guys can carry on i get straight i'm getting strange messages on my computer here <laughs> well please so, that means uh, they're dead <clears throat> well, my cat is sleeping behind me so i know it's not her this time a cat today. I sent you a, a picture that I took in Australia of the largest small Magellanic clouds with just my camera. Yeah, and you can clearly see the large one as a barred spiral. At least you see the bar. Yeah, yeah. Matter well, of fact, the bar is pretty much all there is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, before okay, you now the yeah before you switch uh, right now, you brought up variable. Was that V Hydra or no? We to that no, later? no. We got that one coming up. Oh, okay. Which is our variable star of the what? Months or week? How often this do we week. have them? There's enough out there we can have a variable star of the week every Monday morning? Oh, yes. Morning. Yes, there are. I was going to say that there, uh, as the blurb says, there are uh, 85 variable stars found in this um, picture. And uh, so that means that there's probably about three times that many in the whole cluster. So around 300 star variable stars, and it has an estimated of 300,000 suns in it. So that would be um, about a thousand, one in every thousand stars you could expect to be caught in its variable stage from that quick back of the envelope estimate. Wow. So we'll go back to V Hydra lady later. And most of the good stuff is done on the backs of envelopes and physics. We haven't we haven't gone anywhere to V Hydra yet, and it's new yeah. Hydra. It's new, yeah. The V is the Greek letter new. Oh, which okay. is uh, English. Like a V to me. Okay. And now we're back in the solar system. There's our ringed planet. With what it's yeah. This is we're looking now at the start of the morning sky. This is Saturn. Um, Titan is here. It's the really easy in small scopes. It's the re easy one to see with a scope. You can definitely see the rings. And this Titan is faint and red. This is May tomorrow 2, morning. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning yeah, at 5 a.m. So this is what you will see if you get up for that. And here's the finder chart for all those goodies. Wow. Is Titan the biggest moon in the solar system? No, second biggest. Behind ours? No, behind Ganymede. Yeah. Ours is, ours is kind of midland. Mm -hmm. oh. So here we are with Saturn. This is, um, oh, what time is this? This is five o'clock in the morning tomorrow morning. So um, this is Saturn down here. It's just rising. This is the east. There's Neptune. The plant, these are the planets that last month disappeared from the western sky. Now they're coming up in the east in the early morning. And then uh, over the year, they'll make their way across the sky. Pluto is seen over here. And well, Pluto is seen if you really hunt for it and have a good map and a big telescope. But <laughs> yes. Yes. And if you look for Pluto, you won't see this. <laughs> this is from the space probe, fly by Pluto. New Horizons. Yeah, the New Horizons, yes. We've also got some good shots of um, the Pluto's moons also. All that white is nitrogen, isn't it? Or is it snow? It's solid nitrogen, mountains of nitrogen, and other gases. Pluto has an atmosphere when it's closer to the sun. And when it's farther away from the sun, its orbit is slightly elliptic. When it's farther away from its sun, the atmosphere freezes out into these uh, snow drifts, these cryo drifts. The thing that always impresses me about Pluto and other things that are made of ice uh, is the Kuiper crater they have. They We see craters on the moon that have a central peak, but the central peak on these ice moons is always like a round dome. 
there's no nothing here that's a jagged peak going up. So yeah. not all of them have any kind of central dome. So but, the energy uh, in the thing that hit it uh, locally melted it, but it quickly froze again. Yeah, and somehow it's still not a solid. It's frozen, uh, still moving or something. I don't know what it is. The mush. Maybe it took Yeah, it took longer to do. But this is the famous heart shape. Yeah. Well, so, my understanding, uh, it, my understanding is the uh, orbit of Pluto is not only tilted from the ecliptic a lot, but it crosses Neptune's orbit at some point, does it not? Yes, yeah. it does. Would there be feasibility of someday somehow they would collide? No, no, no. They're I in a resonance. Otherwise, it would have been gone. It yeah. would have happened sometime in the past. They're in a resonance to where when Pluto comes into its closest point, Neptune is on the other side of the sun from it. Mm -hmm. yeah, but Neptune's going a little faster. So sooner yeah, or later. But they're in a resonance. They're they're timed. Really? Yes. Well, even though, okay. When, when planetary systems start out, they start out from a disk that is gravitationally attracting subunits of itself to itself. And so all these pre-planets and planets and stuff form but they're not yet in a resonance. And those that are not in a resonance collide and they, they throw, they throw themselves, the, the product flies out of the solar system or it moves into a resonance. But the only ones that survive are the ones that are in resonance with, as a group. Um, stability is not an individual thing. Mm -hmm. It's a cooperative effort. And there's and a group planets, of these objects that are in orbits like that, that are in that resonance called Plutinos. Yes. Okay, so like Maki Maki, is that one? M-A-K-E twice? I don't think that's a Plutino, but yeah, it's it's in a, it's in out there too. But it, it doesn't cross the orbit of Neptune, so the resonance is not quite as critical there. What about that fat bowling pin, two of them together that they found? That's <laughs> way out there in the Kuiper Belt. Okay, so, so this little planet we're looking at right now is in the Kuiper Belt, but it's also considered inside our solar system yes uh, kind of the start of the kuiper belt uh, it has a fuzzy edge okay but then okay. way out there is the oort cloud well, well let's go back to the star cluster here or what oh, this is the next star cluster oh this is another one certainly looks like a yeah. cluster to me yeah, it's got yeah. more, a lot more uh, orange stars in it yeah and nice blue one there oh yeah huh let me go. Let me set the stage here. This is Pluto, as we just looked at Pluto. This is M75, which is brighter and easier to find. And this is the globular cluster we just had a quick look at. So the way to find Pluto at this time is to go to M75, which is this cluster. It's much easier to find. And then to move slightly up. Put in a very wide eyepiece <clears throat> in your telescope, and then you'll see Pluto, which will look like a very flat and unassuming star. So this is the exact same kind of cluster the other one we just saw is? Yeah. Very similar type. Yeah. It has its own classifications, its own metallicity, its own populations. But yes, it's another um, globular cluster. Nice little asterism here, little yeah. hooked thing. Yeah. This could also and, be and a nice big... density too. This one's this one's nicely condensed. Yeah. Now you notice the condensation here looks a little lopsided. It's got it's got an elliptical concentration, and then inside of it more of a circular concentration, and it's moved to the to this side with a lot more faint stuff over here. But that brightness is from a big collection of stars that are very close together, would you say? Yes. yes. And this, each, this actually has uh, what might be considered the start or the end of a uh, spiral arm. From this point, the, there's a concentration of stars that goes up here and then curves over. And then there's another one like that. So these could be once a spiral arm or maybe a faint imitation of one. And there's a very nice linear cascade of stars going across here. Oh, yeah. So that's a very picturesque thing. 
Could be another captured mini galaxy. Well, it, it could depends be. how you define galaxy. <laughs> yeah. There's no such thing as a mini galaxy. What are those? Well, that's um, what this is. Oh. Before before our galaxy was a flat disk or roughly flat disk, um, it was a sphere. An elliptical. It, what's that? It was an elliptical. It was it was a, a collection of stars that were d averaging their um, angular momentum so that they had a single rotation. And once they achieved having a single rotation axis, then the they couldn't resist gravitational collapse in one dimension. So a, a sphere will become a rotating sphere and eventually become a flat rotating disk. This, these things are held together by their own gravity. They're small enough and strong enough because maybe they were galaxies at one point, but these resisted that, that uh, collapse of the general crowd. These were concentrations in the cloud that succumbed to it by orbiting the core of our galaxy, not by falling into the disk. Is there a scientific word that describes that process, that uh, phenomenon that would apply to solar systems? Relaxation, I think it's called for globulars. Yeah, cons conservation of angular momentum. See, globulars don't have a fixed unit rotation. It's a lot like a hive of bees all coming and going and in and out and stuff, but they're all held together by the mutual gravitation, but not uh, with a single rotation. And is there a big supermassive, you know what, in the middle of that white? I don't think there is at the core of every big galaxy, I think, but I don't, some, some of these globular clusters I know do have a black hole in them or a number of small black holes, but I don't know if they all have one. Yeah. It'd be an undecided thing at this point for this one, probably. Yeah. Boy, they're sure changing the rules and names and things about black holes lately. All kinds of new evaporation. A lot of, yeah, a lot of activity going on in research on that. <laughs> now, this is an even worse finder chart on the, <laughs> on the, on the uh, Chuck standard. Uh, Crater. Rating. Yeah. <laughs> this is a small constellation called Crater. Um, they have um, the stars listed, but they don't show the magnitude. This is uh, north, and this is the variable star. That's what the V stands for. Oh, so it actually is V. It's not new. Well, no, this this is not new. This is this, this is, is V high variable. rate. Yeah. This is, but it is V high. This is they call it V hydra, but it's new hydra and you. Well, uh, well, V hydra, no, no, V hydra, because that it may also be new hydra, but V variable stars first get a capital R, then S, then T, then U, okay. then V within each constellation. So, okay, that's that's what this designation is. Yeah. But okay, it may also be new, notes. depending on its level of brightness. Have a new. Yeah. Okay, and we're looking at its flexibility. So or flexibility. Here's a red carbon star. Uh -huh. uh, very interesting. It changes from sixth magnitude, and you're lucky to see it at that. Mostly it's around eight magnitude, but it can drop down to uh, below 13th magnitude. This is right here, six. That's the limit of the human eye naked eye on a very dark night. Some people claim they can see to seventh magnitude from super night, super dark skies. Um, and a six inch telescope will reach down to six magnitude here. So this is easily visible. This is a, a long period variable. This plot goes from 1900, 1905 to 2020. Two. <clears throat> Been looking at that sucker that long. Man. Yes. Now these these things down here are visual observations, and up around the '60s, after World War II, they started using um, photometry, electronic photometry, with vacuum tubes. There was a sensitive enough vacuum tube called a, a 1P21 tube that was able to measure a single thing, but it was like a one pixel stare. 
you had to be sure that you had a diaphragm to block out all the other light except for the star. So it started getting very um, technical, accurate. And then um, around the 1990s, when amateurs became getting, and we started making where I worked, we started making focal planes, solid state focal planes for telescopes. This stuff, the photometry became very accurate because <clears throat> you had imaging systems. So you could, you could get the star and its comparison stars all in the same field of view and take the data at one time. Photometry with this doing variable star observations with modern amateur equipment is very interesting, very fun. So but this each, is a 530 day brightness. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say each one of those blue dots represents a, uh, a value of light or brightness. An yeah. observation. And yet yeah. all over the place, huh? why? Why would the star is variable? Yeah, the star it's changes awful. its brightness. Why wouldn't it just be a single series of dots making a line? Why? That's what it is. Really? Different values? Some Look at around 1994, you get a really steep vertical line almost. Okay. Yeah, it's right here. And you're always going to have instrumental noise and, you know, fluctuations in the atmosphere and stuff that are yeah. going to dither things around a little bit. Okay. For example, these two dots right here that are so close they're touching each other, that, that is non-physical. So one of these dots, probably the leftmost one, is an error and probably should be up here somewhere. So maybe there was a little more uh, haze in the atmosphere that night, or someone didn't uh, spit wipe his filter off or something, you know, so <laughs> you don't know. But there, there is some fluctuations in it. That's why you try to put error bars on things. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole science of how to calculate your error. And you also try to use those calibration stars to say, well, it, you know, tonight it's looking dimmer than it did last night, but I know that star isn't variable. So this is its actual brightness. And so comparing mm -hmm. it to, to V Hydre here, V Hydre should now be at this brightness, you know. So there's, there's all kinds of calibration that has to be done. Okay, just to recap, the smaller the number on the left, the brighter. Right. And the higher the number, that's when it dims. Yes, yes. you're going down on this chart, you go dim, you go dark. Go down, you go dark. So Bruce is right. 94 was a dark time. It must have disappeared even. I don't know. I guess they could see it if there's a blue dot there. Mm -hmm. Yes, telescopes could still reach it. Wow. So this 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 star, V Hydrate, has a visible primary companion, a vis visible binary companion, 46 seconds of an arc distance. So that's easy to separate. It also has an unseen companion with an 8.5 year orbit. And it is it is distinctly reddish in a telescope. Yeah, yes. It's not but, just the sort of orangey-ish look that you get naked eye with things like Betelgeuse or Aldebaran. It is <laughs> like ruby red, especially the, the dimmer it looks, the, the redder it looks. So there's a tr trinary like Alpha Centauri. Three yes. Of now there, you get a very deep, you get fluctuations up here, but you get very deep um, darks here about every 17 years. And this is believed to the, be due to the unseen companion that is producing a dust cloud that gets in the way of the star from, or the V hydra. Hmm. Now, just out of curiosity, gentlemen, answer me this. Um, why couldn't those dips be con considered a planet, a big one, transiting? Because they don't, um, if they were plant transiting, it would be um, more regular and um, always the same depth. You wouldn't get all this all over the place stuff. And the periodicity would be much more uh, precise. Precise, right, exactly. But don't when they do find an exoplanet that's transiting a star does it turn out to look a lot like what we're looking at here when they graph it yeah except for, for its more precise periodicity usually yeah. okay, so it all looks it's like a heartbeat on the screen yeah 
Now, that's if you have a single planet. If you have multiple planets, you start to introduce all kinds of other things in here, but you still can pull out other periodicities. You know, you provide yeah. Fourier analysis to it and you start to see other periodicities that correspond to the other planet. But periodicities that are precisely repeat themselves, the longer you observe them, the more precise your data is going to get and the noise will disappear. This is a case where you get rid of noise by adding noise for uh, because uh, your noise goes well we'll get into that later <laughs> you're talking about signal noise ratio yes the ejections uh this 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 system is modeled it's such that it has based on its data and its spectral data it has high speed outflows of material that is collimated into jets it also has a disk of material around the star Hmm. So this star is considered to be at the end of its asymptotic giant branch, AGB on a, a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. It's at the end of that phase of evolution, and it is starting into the phase where it is generating a planetary nebula. The mechanism for the ejection of this material gives key insights into the formation of planetary nebula. The ejections have been modeled as bullets of uh, plasma and carbon. Why do you suppose we don't have a Cepheid variable of the months? Why are they rarely brought up? Well, that's another topic, and we can get to that. Um, I, if you want, I can go through and pick out Cepheid variables of the month. That would be an interesting thing to do. But that's this one, I, want to, I put this in here because it. you are always asking about planetary nebulas, don't they come from a nova? And no, they don't come from a nova. They come from this. This is a this is a variable star that is starting to slough off its outer layers and in a series of burps and bullets and plasma jets. And this is where planetary nebulas come from. It's not gonna be from an explosion. It's gonna be from this. There may be, you know, um, like coronal mass ejections, eruptions and stuff like that over a period of time, but no single blasting event. It's more like belching and burping than blowing up. Right. But is it sloughing off the upper elements beyond carbon and oxygen? And Well, it probably hasn't formed many much higher than that. Oh, we get those from a big uh, a nova, don't we? From a this supernova, is, this yeah. This is sloughing off a lot of carbon monoxide, according to uh, spectra. Carbon so monoxide. Got, carbon. So it's got a lot of carbon, a lot of oxygen. Yeah, and that's kind of the end phase of life of a low mass star like our sun. Yeah. So the C and the O get bond together as molecules. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's cool enough. That's why it's red that this so, can happen. These are artist renditions of the unseen companion. And the unseen companion is believed to actually pass through the outer reaches of. Uh, the variable star, and it generates, like out of its rotational north pole, it generates these beams of particles that it's throwing out. Not particles, but plasma. So that's the stage of V hydrate that's starting to form um, planetary nebula. Now this one... I, I is, think we're, we're getting close to uh, curtain time here. Yeah, we'll be real fast. Okay. This, this is um, Cygnus, Deneb, and over here is Albirio, the double star, and here is Albirio close up. This is ah. known as the Boy Scout star, the UCLA star, the University of Michigan star, depending on your history and background. It's quite striking in these colors. And that's a good photograph to get. You people photograph and they, they blur it out by overexposing. Uh, Oversaturated, yeah. Oversaturating, thanks. That's what I was looking for. That's the blue and gold, right? The double star. Yeah. yeah. That's, well, that's, that's we, can, we can go into detail on that in the weeks to come, gentlemen. Uh, how about Auriga? We didn't get to that one either, did we? Nope. We'll dance? get to that. Oh, let me just show you that real quick. Is Auriga is... a constellation or an asteroid? Yes. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, a constellation. 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 No. This right here in a line are three very dramatic open clusters, M37, M36, M38. 
Now, this is the what the planetarium software does this. But when I look at the red lines, but when I look at the sky, I see this. So I added the white lines because this, 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 and this is what I see. Yeah, they're uh, all part of our region. Right? Yeah, because these are brighter stars. And yeah. th this line, I, I think, is just shouldn't be there anyway. Well, that's that's, that's those, those are the H.A. Ray, the red lines. It looks like the H.A. Ray constellation lines, which are kind of weird compared to the classical ones. Yeah. So anyway, um, that's the all. Naked eye, you see a big kite up there with five stars. Right. Or a bent horseshoe. Yeah, OK. Ah. So it's, it's, I see it. I see a house with the, yeah. the base because the way it rises here in the east, northeast, this is the base and this is the peak, the roof. So it kind of lines up this way. I see the Pentagon hit by a bomb. <laughs> yeah. And right now, Venus is, so this is in the evening sky. So Venus is right there. And this this whole constellation is going to disappear. So well, let's, it might show up. I mean, yeah. Let's talk about it next week, gentlemen. This has been awesome. It'll definitely be gone by next, oh, next week. No, it'll still be, it'll just be it's more gone. gone. Uh, just for just for my own edification, uh, somebody, all all the members of the club, our astronomical unit, will be sent a Zoom link right before this Friday night. Yes. Yeah. General meeting at yeah. Farron Hall. We're going to have a young man named uh, Joseph Farah, along with the director of development, uh, Sandy Seal, or is it Searle? Seal. Uh, Seal. Okay, she's going to introduce him. I'll introduce her. And we're going to talk about Las Cumbres observatories and then go into the center of the galaxy. That big picture of our black hole. I, I think Joseph was part of doing that. So, yeah. Bruce, thanks for getting on board. And Chuck, you're awesome. Give my love to your wife and you to your pet, uh, Mr. President. We'll see you guys next, well, Friday first. And then Monday we'll gather here again. That's it. See you. Number 115.